Ladies and gentlemen, we are now presenting the plenary session on Asia United in Diversity. As we all know, Asia is gigantic, it's enormous, and 48 countries, and some of them are not very united with each other. In fact, some of them are very severe competitors with each other. However, <clears throat> there had been very many multilateral organizations established to try to unite even considering the differences of the Asian countries to unite at least the, you know, the business part, the commercial side. So as we all know, here we have people from diverse Asian countries. You know, we have <coughs> Mr. Yoshito Hori from Japan. We have Mr. Kopsak Chutiku from Thailand, Claire Chen from Taiwan, Bo Ingi from Uzbekistan, and myself, uh, although uh, I live in between Brazil and New York, and although I'm a Chinese descendant, uh, I was born in Shanghai, so I think we'll have an interesting panel to discuss the diversity of the Asian nations. So like I said, RECEPT that was started you know, as a trade organization, uh, the TPP which Obama started but then Trump left, the United States under Trump left the TPP and we have the Shanghai Organization Conference. We have many multilateral treaties and organizations to unite such a diverse area, unite in terms of business and uh, you know, in terms of politics, I think there are some areas that cannot be so easily united. So what I would like to do is I would like to ask the first gentleman on the list who has a very great, big experience, great experience living in many of the countries in Asia to make his first presentation about what we're, the topic is, how he sees the diversity and the united, and how to unite the, this diversity of Asia. Uh, Bo, and Bo Inge Anderson, who's the chief executive, uh, he uh, works for the Uzbekistan government, Swedish uh, gentleman, with a vast experience in the automotive industry, worked for General Motors. You, you can introduce yourself, please, Bo. So good afternoon, and first I thank Frank and the team for hosting us here today. So already now I'm Swedish, and then I worked for General Motors 21 years, uh, 15 years as head of global purchasing. Then I worked in Russia uh, as president of Gauss Group, largest commercial vehicle maker. Then I was president of Avtovaz, largest passenger car maker. Then I was running a Japanese company called Yasaki, that is in electronics, all operations outside Japan. And since one and a half years, I'm in Uzbekistan. I'm talking as a businessman, I'm talking about as an automotive. Being a student of automotive industry, being a student of governments, in reality everything starts with the financials. And I don't know about you, but for me, the COVID was a rude awakening. In 2020, for a couple of months, we had no revenue. And we lost enormous amount of money. So for me in this situation in Asia, we need to ask ourselves, what is important? Where do we want to be? And who can help us to get synergies? If I look historically, Japan went to Thailand very early, and Toyota was one of, the, one of the forefront. It has been a very, very successful experience. If I take Suzuki, went to India very early, with Suzuki Maruto, has been very successful. So what is my message? 
We are all driven based on financials. It's very important to keep the financials in center. It's very important to take decisions. We are living in an environment we need to take decisions quicker. It's very important to be comfortable to be uncomfortable. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Bo. And uh, the next person I would like to uh, make her presentation is Claire Chen from Taiwan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Claire Chen. First of all, I would like to thank to Frank and to uh, inviting me to join this uh, such wonderful, awesome. Uh, Horace is a, a global vision community. This community makes me like my home <laughs> for many years. Thank you, Frank. Um, Claire, I was born in Taiwan and uh, when I was a teenager, and I moved to States in San Francisco, California, Bay Area. Pretty much go to school there and sort of grew up there. Um, the, had multicultural, multinational, uh, with me, like more Americanized, like Western, but I do keep the, some part of culture in you know, Asian culture. Uh, we are um, in a financial advisory and investment management consultancy. We manage in a startup portfolio, mostly test out in early stage. We also um, providing the private placement of the Silicon Valley unicorns uh, pre IPO pipelines. And uh, that's it. Thank you. I'm so honored and happy to be on the stage the first time, so I'm kind of nervous. Please forgive me. Thanks. Thank you. I'm also, I also want to say that I'm very, very happy that we are able to meet in the Horasis conferences in a, in a presential way rather than just through the uh, internet. So, you know, I first started. Uh, going to the Horaces in 2007 in, in, in Frankfurt in Germany. And I have, I think I missed one year in all these years because I only missed it because I had urgent business affairs to attend to. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really a very worthwhile uh, conference that I would not miss uh, if I didn't have any urgent matters to attend to. So uh, now I would like to ask Mr. Kopsak Chutikui to, uh, from Thailand to make his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tang. So yes, uh, certainly, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we are a diverse group. Certainly Asia is the most diverse region in the world. Uh, and, but sitting up here on the podium, on the panel here, I think we are all related to Genghis Khan. So three quarters of the world has the DNA of Genghis Khan. I, I don't know whether it applies uh, to, to Sweden as well, but I'm sure yes, certainly somehow the Vikings came into touch with uh, Genghis Khan. So Japan, yes, certainly, yes, yes. Uh, no, you don't have to be occupied, you see, because people travel back and forth. <laughs> yes, so uh, I'm, I'm sure Genghis Khan would have been infatuated you know, by the beauty of, uh, of, uh, of Japanese uh, you know, uh, ladies and all that. So, yeah, anyway, so the, that's the kind of ancient diversity. But as you say, uh, 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 that later, within Asia, we can find very few examples of this uh, motto of e pluribus unum, unity in diversity, one in diversity. This is more like an American, uh, modern uh, uh, iteration uh, of a global community, a new nation born. But in Asia, do we do also find in Indonesia, for example, uh, Constitution of Indonesia has that idea also, unity in diversity. Indonesia certainly began its life called the United States of Indonesia. 
And in the Constitution, it says quite plainly that human rights are respected uh, and advocated for all people, not only for Indonesians. That's the only one country, I think, that has a human rights court, especially. And they are saying that they can fight for human rights in any country. It doesn't have to be Indonesian citizens involved. At the same time, we have another big example, uh, similar, uh, of India, where diversity has become a way of life also, because they do live in the midst of diversity. So we have those two uh, examples of people uh, uh, living through uh, practical day-by-day, day-to-day diversity. But overall, I would say that in uh, Asia, diversity is not something that is given or celebrated or even endorsed and, and practiced as an ideal even. What is more common in Asia would be commonalities, sameness, being the same as people in your community, not individual. Uh, you are expected to conform. Conformity is the main word, I think, for a lot of Asian societies. And although we are diverse, we say each country is diverse because the region is diverse, different cultures, different religions. But in many countries, I'm afraid to say, they would prefer not to have diversity. They would prefer to have conformity, the same, even ethnic, purity even, I would say, uh, within many of the countries in Asia. And that tribalism, I think, leads to conflict, leads to war. And I think that is the question that we are faced with. That is the question that uh, uh, Frank has posed for us, whether we can find unity in diversity in Asia, whether we can use that diversity to be a strength economically, politically. Uh, Mr. Tang, you have mentioned some of the mechanisms that have been brought uh, into place for Asia, RCEP, TPP, and other uh, trading uh, mechanisms, economic cooperation. But we have no overarching structure mechanisms to deal with political security and other cooperation for the whole of Asia. That is still missing unlike, of course, the European community or even the African Union for the whole continent. So what we are faced with now, though, is that before the RCEP, TPP, APEC, and all those uh, other uh, you know, uh, economic kind of free trade areas, endeavors to have economic trade going together with diversity, people having different regimes, different governments. So those two columns, economic, political security, were going along uh, in an age of globalization after the end of the Cold War. But the concern now, I think, is that those two parallel columns are collapsing into one. That maybe businessmen, investors, traders, cannot take for granted a stable political security environment and say that it doesn't matter. We just trade. We just concentrate on economic exchange, investment, because those two things perhaps are now collapsing into one. And people are saying that, look, if you don't have the same regime, same ideas as us, there can be no trade with you. We cannot invest with you. Governments are telling their private sector investors to say, don't go there. They are different from us. They have a different regime. They have different ideals. We have to be with the people who share the same ideals. So perhaps that is the big question now that is being posed. Can this diversity of Asia, East Asia particularly, Indo-Pacific, that has seen the greatest growth of uh, human well-being, economic uh, development 
in the history of humankind, can that be maintained in an era when people are now asking the question, is globalization really leading to a flat earth, that everybody is the same, everybody can go anywhere, invest anywhere, but are there barriers now being put up to say that, look, we thought that economics, trade, investment would make everybody the same, would make people the same. But there is now second thought that, no, we are being taken advantage of. Let's roll back a bit. Let's roll back out of TPP. Let's roll, not join RCEP. RCEP is one part. So there is, again, this question that in many sessions we have been trying to grapple with. Is there really at least a de facto decoupling, if not a conscious decoupling? And what would that mean for the trade, investment, economic environment for all of us in Asia, even though it may not lead to direct war, conflict? But I would say that beyond that, now, we cannot answer all those questions. It's beyond that. Some things are beyond you know, e even the best intentions uh, of, of, <laughs> of human beings, of good people, uh, of, you know, horasis. Horasis, of course, means looking forward, seeing the future. It's a Greek word. But Priti would agree with me that there is a similar word uh, in Hindi, that uh, horasat in Thai. Horasat is seeing the future. So I don't know how those two words came together. Greece to India to Southeast Asia. Every day, you know, people in Thailand, especially the women, go to see the fortune teller, the Horasat, yeah, to try to look into the future. And that is the element, the cross-cultural element that has always been there for us uh, in Asia. But is that coming to an end? Is that coming to an end? Speaking to a Japanese audience, I would say that Japan is now, will be on 1st January, the chair of the G7 group, the most powerful group perhaps uh, in the world. In May will be the G7 summit in Hiroshima. What is the theme for Hiroshima? Is it more trade, more investment? more exchanges, or even digital economy. In Hiroshima, I was told the theme must be and would be about peace. Rising above all the differences, rising above all the concerns, geopolitical uh, concerns and divisions in the world. So hopefully Japan, in May, chair of G7, can bring about that idea that we must have peace. And that this meeting, the Horasis meeting, looking into the future, can lay the groundwork for that. Uh, Mr. Chang, you know, fellow panelists. That, uh, and we have uh, Mr. Hori here, who will push, perhaps, hopefully, that idea for G7 uh, in Hiroshima to have peace. And yesterday, I think a lot of us uh, met in the morning and had uh, the tea ceremony, the soda. I think it's spelled choda, but I was told it should be pronounced soda. Is that right? Tea ceremony. Ocha. Huh? Ocha. Ocha. Uh, the ocha, yeah? Uh, ocha uh, tea ceremony. And I took this pamphlet from them that what are the elements of this tea ceremony? There are five elements and hopefully I can pronounce in Japanese correctly. Uh, wa means harmony. Uh, ke, respect. Se, purity. Jack, tranquility. So these are the four elements that is in the ancient tea ceremony of Japan. Where is this long cultural tradition belief has gone to? Was it lost in the globalization? 
was it lost when everything was leveled into a glo flat world, a globalized world? Should we bring these elements back? Because it's going to be very hard, for example, to have a mechanism that can translate, transcend the whole of Asia and to bring everybody together. I don't think that would be possible in our lifetimes. Perhaps it may be possible when India becomes the most populous country in the world and brings about this uh, Horasa, Horasis idea, looking into the future, a better future. So I hope I can leave with our Japanese uh, hosts uh, and colleagues here this idea that please bring back your tradition, your cultural values, uh, into the intergovernmental discourse of how to bring peace, unity from diversity for Asia. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and now we'll go to our speaker from Japan, Mr. Yoshito Hori. Hello. I'm so glad to be here and welcome to Japan. And uh, I've been attending Horace since 2008 or 2009 from Zurich. And I was in India and I was in Thailand and the first time to be in Japan. So I'm so happy to welcome you to Japan. And I'm Yoshi Hori, who is the founder and CEO of Globis University. This has become number one business school in Japan in terms of the number of enrollment. And it's one of the largest business schools in Asia. And we have offices in Shanghai, Singapore, and also Bangkok. And we open up San Francisco and Brussels. We also do venture capital. And talking about United in Diversity, let me talk one part about diversity, and then I talk about United. And in terms of diversity, if you compare to Europe, Asia is so much diverse. In terms of region, you never know which part is Asia. In World Cup, it started, you know, Middle East is part of Asia. And also Australia and New Zealand is also part of Asia. And then South, you know, like Central Asia, who used to be a part of uh, South Soviet Union, is now a part of Asia right now. So the Asia region has become so much wider and not much good to definition. And in terms of religion, you know, in terms of Europe, it's mostly Christianity. And Asia is uh, some Hindu, some uh, Buddha, Buddhism, some Confucius, some Islam, some Christianity. It's so much diverse. Language itself is mostly Latin in uh, Europe, but here in, in Asia, if, even in India, they have 10, more, more than 10 languages. It's so diverse. And uh, in terms of economic development compared to Europe, you know, let's exc exclude East Europe, which, which has started after uh, 1990 uh, when Soviet Union collapsed. But in case of Asia, Japan has led as a flying geese economic development. And then Taiwan, Hong Kong, and South Korea and Singapore followed, and then ASEAN. So the economic development has been so much differences, so that you know, it's so much diverse in terms of economy, in terms of region, in terms of language, and religion, and culture. And therefore, it's so much diverse compared to even to, let's say, Latin America or Europe. Uh, Europe. And so let's agree that Asia is so much diverse. And the second part about United, I would question whether we should be united or not. In case of Europe, they could be united as EU, and there is a currency as Euro. But in case of Asia, I'd like to point out three things which are so important to be united. One is the political structure, autocracy or democracy. They are, you know, they are the biggest nation in Asia is autocracy, which is China. And there is a danger coming from North Korea of missile and nuclear testing. And that's dangerous, and they are autocracy, and they could be called dictatorship as well, because one man is not controlling the whole nation. Compared to democracy that we have, the rest of those two nations, like we are running as a democratic na nations. So it's very difficult to be united. Secondly, they also about the opinion, like freedom of speech. One country is blocking internet, and then therefore there is no free flow of data, free flow of information, and opinion has been censored. And you don't see many Chinese speakers on this you know, like a conference as well. Not many people can come, not maybe because of COVID, but sometimes because it's very difficult to speak up in open you know, environment. So that is blocking uh, to be united. Thirdly, economy. Economy, in terms of economy, we have TPP, but China is not a part of it. 
And then there is an effort to include China. Uh, but um, you know, if you think about the rule of the economy, uh, there are you know, some not, like, uh, not enough transparency in Chinese regulation. And uh, that you know, is also blocking the uh, being united as an Asian. So I would debate that we don't have to be united. We don't have to be united. However, we are operating as friends like from Thailand and also from Taiwan. And a friend of, from Taiwan must be a little bit worried about the situation developing in China uh, regarding the uh, strong uh, position of the Chinese uh, regime towards Taiwan. And we are also worried about what is going on in Taiwanese uh, uh, situation. At the same time, Senkaku Island that we have uh, close to Okinawa. And then what happened to you know, uh, Ukraine uh, from Russia is, uh, is a big wake up call to Asia nations. So it's not more to be united. More important is the peace, as you mentioned. And then we're going to have a G7 uh, hosted by Japan in Hiroshima. Hiroshima is the best place to talk about peace because Hiroshima is the first city that atomic bomb has been dropped. And therefore, it's going to be a good place for G7 leaders to be talking about peace. And then the topic will be mostly Russia and also China and how to engage, how to, uh, how to make the peace in the uh, global uh, environment. That's going to be the discussion that we have to be talking about. I would recommend Kishida-san to do tea ceremony <laughs> in the morning with the seven leaders. No, I would say that, like uh, uh, for Biden and uh, Sun Snook and uh, Schlock and also uh, you know, Macron, and all the leaders should be doing tea ceremony and talking about Jack Wah and everything like that. And that's going to be a good you know, sign for uh, the world. And then you don't have to be united. We are going to have a peaceful, diverse Asia. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to say that the unifying force between the Asian nations that are so diverse and politically, let's say, not in conformance with each other is business. Money has no religion, has no political affiliation, and has no color. So trade, for example, one big example is Despite the differences between Taiwan and China, trade between Taiwan and China is gigantic and will continue to be so because it's in the best interest of both countries to continue making money with each other. So despite all the political differences, and without going into autocracy or democracy, because I don't want to become involved in political discussions here, but the fact is, I gave an interview some years ago to BBC World TV, and the reporter was so shocked by what I said that he wrote a book, and you can buy it on Amazon.com. Because during this conference, during this interview, I mentioned that successive Chinese governments since Deng Xiaoping has been the leader or has created the most gigantic advance of human rights in the, in the history of mankind. So he was so shocked, he looked at me because of course the West always hits on China because of human rights. And I said, you know, the essence of human rights is the ability to afford a human being a minimum level of human dignity. And that is, of course, a plate of food every day and a roof over their heads. That is the essence of human rights. And as an economist, and not as a politician, if you examine, you know, China has lifted over 700 million Chinese people from misery into the middle class. And Chinese investments in trade, for example, in the last three years, Brazil has 125 billion US dollars of surplus in the trade with China, because Brazil, as you know, is a big food exporter. So this Chinese investments in trade 
has also lifted hundreds of millions of Africans, Southeast Asians, Latin Americans, and so on. So I'm not here to defend autocracy or democracy. I'm just saying that the essence of human rights is the ability for a human being to have a minimum level of human dignity. And that, so Humphrey Hawksley, who was the, who is the reporter from BBC World TV, he wrote a book called Democracy Kills, and you can buy it on Amazon.com, okay? Uh, so I think that the unifying force between all such a diverse region as Asia is money. Money has no political barriers, has no religious barriers, and no racial barriers. And that is the unifying force. And of course, for, the, for example, during the COVID pandemic, we have learned that we must unite. It's no use just vaccinating everybody in one country and then you travel around or people from other countries will bring the disease to you. So the pandemic has to teach us that we must collaborate, not only Asia, but the whole world. We must collaborate for our own self-interest to be able to defend ourselves, we must collaborate and unite our collaboration. So I think that we, we do have a future of being united through money. Okay, thank you. Sure. I don't think money will become the uniting factor at all. Money is just a, a medium of exchange and that's it, period. And what would be the more uniting factors are values, religion, belief, and also uh, the system of the uh, political structure, either democracy, autocracy, and also the culture, and also more, more about that you know, is, uh, is uh, more of the uniting factors. And because people believe that belief is more important than money, and also the way of life is more important, and peace is more important, and also human rights are more important, and also basic rights of the freedom of speech, are that's more important than money. And therefore, money will be just a, a medium of exchange, and that's period, and also the way to accumulate wealth. But there are more things that are more valuable uh, to, than money. And therefore, uh, the fact that there is a trade between China and Taiwan, and that's fine. But if there is, there could be some factor you know, to be there's a factor that there might be some kind of conflict between China and Taiwan, and that money will be lost. However, I hope that will be the one to defend or make hesitant of the regime of China not to do because of economic tie with China, Taiwan. Let's hope that is the truth. Thank you, Mr. Yoshito. I will have something to say. Um, I agree your point, and um, I also don't want to get into the political uh, situation, but according to Taiwan KMT, one of family friends, to say how to unite uh, between the China or Taiwan situation, according to the KMT party, that I, they think there's three important elements. One is um, democracy, if only democracy. And number two is freedom of party, that you can, you know, freedom of party, the different party. And number three is the human right. So if China, Taiwan is like this, just like Taiwan, Taiwan is pretty much like America, then that can be united. And I agree the culture and the religions and also business trade actually involving a lot because people still need food and, and you know, to survive. Thank you. Charles, thanks. So, Bo, what do you think of all this? I take it from a different angle. We are all leaders in, in one way or another. Uh, at home, we normally work for our wives. That's at least my case. So she is a leader at home. And if you take COVID, COVID was a wake-up call for all of us. And what I learned during COVID is if you have no money, you, you have 
no opportunity to do anything. And secondly, what we as leaders do, right or wrong, is mainly four things. We give people hope that there is a future. We give some type of direction. It can be KPIs or it can be financial metrics. It can be market share growth. It can be other things. Third, we allocate resources, people and money. And we say where we are going to do more, where we're going to do less. We do budgets. We do budget follow-up. And last, we follow up and see how effective it is. As I said before, I've been part of automotive industry for 35 years. It's a very large industry. When you take all pieces included, it's $10 trillion. 1955, 85% of cars were made in the United States. The last six, seven years, China is the largest market in the world and the largest producer. But if you go 60 years back, it was dominated by the United States. I see a fantastic growth in, in Asia. I shared my examples before about Japan and, and Thailand, Japan and India. My perspective, it comes back to leadership. In COVID, some leaders didn't do very much. Others did a lot. You need to be close to your people. You, you cannot manage from the boardroom. You need to be close to the people. You need to see the impact. And from that perspective, I'm an optimist. Thank you, Bo. In my last um, keynote speaker speech that I was uh, made at the Oxford University, and uh, many of the African leaders were present, Bill Clinton was present, I said that uh, for generations, you know, after the former colonial masters of Africa stripped Africa of its wealth, Africa was left as a forgotten continent, lost continent for many decades, until China started investing massively in the infrastructure of the continent. And many of the African nations today are, if you look at the statistics, have the fastest rate of growth in their economic development. And some of the African leaders, the president of Rwanda, for example, and so on, were there, they agreed. And so development, you know, there is no, let's say, I have always lived in democratic countries my whole life. I have never lived in under autocracy. But uh, I think that when you're starving, <laughs> I think that you think more of food than of freedom of speech. But uh, anyhow, so I think that we should discuss the, you, you, you know, how we can unite Asia, keeping our different political beliefs, okay? because I don't think we're going to change the democracy of many of the countries that are embedded in democracy, and we're not gonna change the countries who have autocracy, and I think they have value in both systems. So uh, rather than talking about political issues, <coughs> I would like to talk, concentrate more on economic development and the furthering of human rights. Now, whether you define that as freedom of speech or able to live as a person and have a minimum level of human dignity, that is up to each one, okay? So would you like to say something more about what we're talking about? Okay, Mr. Tang. Well, certainly, well, first of all, your, your points that you have made, and I think we hear quite a lot, that, oh, look, you know, six, seven hundred million Chinese have been lifted out of poverty, you know, middle class, uh, tremendous achievements, certainly. But there, I think we have to give credit to also individual Chinese people more, uh, or even, you know, at least uh, with the party or with the government. Because individual Chinese have done that for themselves, too. Given the opportunity, uh, they have uh, utilized that. Uh, in fact, they are the first capitalists, I would say, 
the first uh, traders, the first mercantilists. Uh, so they have done that for themselves, for their families, uh, to raise themselves up. So this is not entirely a reflection on what the system is, how good it is in taking, bringing people up, and whether it was done uh, with a acceptable uh, uh, disregard for other aspects of human life, of human rights, uh, of denying people uh, certain other uh, opportunities to live a full life. So, so that's uh, one point, I, I would say. Second point, in order to not to be too political, so it's not about a democratic or a dictatorship, not a binary between two Ds. I would like to add again, uh, and, and also to leave with uh, uh, the Japanese uh, host of the G7, a third D that is, I think, also as important, and that is decency. If we can have an agreement on what are the parameters of decency, of actions, of in individuals, of governments, of states, how they conduct themselves, going beyond political ideology, beyond the creed uh, that is accepted and all of that. Because again, when we talk about culture, diversity, all that, we have to look whether it's, it's not unique to any particular country, area, or even region. Even the word Asia, again, is a Greek word, meaning those people towards the east, Anatolia, you know, it was even a sort of uh, looking down uh, word, you know, these are Anatolians, Asians, you know, beyond the pale, and that became a word. And now we are proud that all oh, Asia will be uh, the center of growth. But again, we have to understand all those cultural uh, uh, the, 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 the heritages uh, that make us what we are today, and not disregard and to say Asia is for Asian, we can't uh, live with the Western narrative, it's, uh, uh, it's something else. We have to look ourselves, to be ourselves, to be even xenophobic. So I think, again, we have to move beyond that. If we cannot agree on a type of government system which is the best for everybody, then okay. I think as human beings, as humanity, we have to then focus on the third D. Not democracy, perhaps not uh, dictatorship or authoritarianism, but common decency that is perhaps lacking, an understanding of what it takes to be living in a society, either regional or global society. And therefore, I would like to leave again uh, with Horizon. This uh, something is very popular among the young people of Thailand, but I was told it's not that so trendy in Japan. But I was asked by my nine-year-old uh, niece to try to look for this in Japan. Uh, to this, uh, sorry, uh, ikagai, ikagai, ikigai, yes. Ikigai. Ah, okay. Uh, ikigai. Ikigai. Okay, sorry. Well, I think you all get what I've been trying to say. But I, then I was going around looking for what it means. Yeah? So it's a philosophy of life, the meaning of life, why it makes uh, life meaningful, a purpose for people, that, you know, overlapping circles. They ask, what do you love? What the world needs? what uh, you are good at, what you can be paid for. I think that's important, uh, the, the, the last uh, circle. But in that circle, so we have you know, passion, mission, uh, profession, vocation, all wrapped around the concept of ikigai. Ikigai, the reason for being, the reason for living. So I think if those uh, cultural uh, unique heritage uh, of Japan can be infused for all of us 
you know, uh, and rising above the economic practicalities, rising above the political pra you know, considerations uh, and, 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 and all the isms, I think that will be a contribution, a contribution to humanity, in fact, and something uh, from this uh, Horasis meeting that looks into the future, going into the Japan G7 uh, summit, uh, and the contribution, the legacy that is left there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to ask each of the panelists to conclude their thoughts in one and a half minutes, and I would like to open for the public to uh, discuss or make questions or whatever. So uh, I will, we'll start with Bo, okay, to finalize the... Yeah, first, we are, we're living in a, in a changing world and change can be good, change can be good, uh, can be bad. And I think COVID was a test for all of us. Secondly, I'm coming back to financial metrics. If we don't have clear financial metrics, you cannot measure success. Third, some of us see employees as a problem. Some of us see employees as an opportunity. And I think it's very important to explain for all employees at all levels what we expect in these new three-dimensional roles. And last, leadership is not the right. It's a responsibility. Thank you. Yoshito, please. Well, we talked about United in diversity. We all agree about diversity. In terms of United, I think the United in terms of government may be difficult because of the political structure. But I think what is important is the United in terms of people, like a grassroots communication, like this Horace's meetings are so much important. In case of South Korea and Japan, there may be some kind of government issues, but I'm not worried because there are vast grassroots communication and interaction among Korean and Japanese, and we are friends. Therefore, even though the government, government may be some kind of disputes in some kind of territory issue, or some of historical issue, we don't care so much because you know, uh, there is a uh, underneath tr uh, trust in between. But what is worrying about China is that we have to have more grassroots communication with them, and uh, so that we can discuss and so forth, so that you know we would feel much better. So I think united in terms of people communication is going to be important. And then you mentioned about ikigai, and in our business school we talk about kokorozashi, which is like mission in life, which is like ikigai, and there are quite a few people coming from Asia. And then the concept of the why we are living and philosophy about why we are born and what we are going to use our life for. And that's part of like Ikigai. And I think that's one thing that you know, we, we can talk about, you know, which is very important. Because nowadays we talk about purpose in businesses. So we have the purpose in individual lives. And also there should be some kind of purpose of Asia as a united in terms of people. And that's what we have to discuss about. Claire. Um, follow that, and uh, Yoshi Tao mentioned about the grass community. Actually, Taiwan and China is really close by grass community in terms of trade and business. And uh, Taiwanese uh, big enterprises actually invest a lot in China last decades, many decades, like uh, 20, 30 years. And uh, Taiwan has the most powerful uh, semiconductor in the world and leading the semiconductor like 15, 20 years ahead. So now the whole world, you see uh, US is trying to set up all the semiconductor manufacturing and Japan actually a semiconductor from Taiwan. They come into Japan, have a big uh, collaboration as well. So I think besides the grass community, uh, United, the, the Asian diversity. Um, you can think about um, the through the grass community and business and trade and also the food and cultures. We just think about a positive way and to, you know, friendly, like lotion in between and you know, mutualize the situations. Yeah. So I, I think that's uh, the best way to keep it in the uh, Peace. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Speaking to us, I, is, I have a very easy summary to make, is that I agree with all of you. So there are elements uh, of truth in each one of your presentations. The problem, of course, now, the challenge for us is to 
consolidate all these strands, all these thoughts uh, into something in a practical sense. So certainly uh, at the moment I would say these are, as you know, uh, the, the Chinese will say, interesting times. May you live in interesting times. Uh, and that is one of, of the legacies, uh, perhaps, uh, of Chinese thought. Uh, that we are in interesting times, challenging times, uh, but the answer, there's no magic one silver bullet that would say this is the way forward. We are at certainly the crossroads. There are no clear answers, no clear pathways. Uh, one, this crossroads can certainly lead to war, massive destruction. Uh, another could again lead to community led by Asia, a rising Asia, a recent Asia. But how to achieve that? I think that is the important big question. And there are strands of thought, you know, of peace, of better living, of decency, uh, of economic, continued economic cooperation to bring people together, mutual interests, common interests. But uh, we have to have a combination of yeah. all of them. And I think we have to continue uh, with our di uh, dialogue and interchanges. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask the public if uh, somebody wants to make a statement or question or whatever. Yes, please. Uh, Sorry, I didn't see the microphone. Please state your name and... Richard Hames. I'm chairman of the Asian Foresight Institute in Bangkok and chief strategist for Eternus Group. Uh, two things. I'm interested in all the talk of leadership when mostly young people today, when we talk about leadership, see incompetence, a lack of courage, and invisible leadership. That, it's just a comment. But my question is more concerned with, are we wise enough as a species to survive our own success? And if so, can we do that when the main way of organizing human affairs is through the nation state, which out of COP27 in Egypt last week has proven to be absolutely incapable of cooperation. Who would like to answer? Bo, would you like to? <laughs> Yoshito, would you I like to? <laughs> you agree? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I agree too. You know, uh, would you like to comment on? I think leadership of the world will always be with United States and China. And you know, they have to agree because they are the two largest emission countries. And they have to agree on the cutback of the emissions. If they don't do that, it's going to be difficult. Would you like to say something about uh, his comment? I hesitate to respond because he's, he's based in Bangkok. So, so we depend on him to give the answers. Because his institute is the Foresight Institute, and our leaders certainly would benefit from that. I agree. Thailand, we have had 13 coups. And now we have a bio-circular economy, uh, whatever, BCG growth model, which implies that things will go around and around. So there's no forward movement, no progression. Things would go around again. And I think this is the Asian trait, that we look and things happen in a circular way, not in a progressive way that moving f into the future. So the question is certainly correct, that uh, what kind of leadership can we expect? Because we, we don't provide that kind of leadership, even in China. I think that is a symptom of the young people, I think. What is, do you call it? 
thumping or pumping, or, no, dropping out, lying low, lying flat. What is that word in Chinese? Okay, I think. So, uh, so, yeah. Unless sure you're pumping. Yeah, I think our okay, time I think is up. Okay, we time time's up. Okay. Yeah. Would anybody else like to make a statement or question, and then we'll fight, we'll end this uh, session. Okay. Now, I just want to say, Yoshito, that uh, I have always lived in democratic countries, and I think democracy is the best solution that we can find. However, you know, I was brought up learning that democracy is from the people by the people, for the people. But I don't know of any nations that is democratic because we have from the people, by the people, for a small percentage of the people. Thank you.